I'd like to thank my patrons for making this video possible, especially Vivian Michael, who was just like, it's so weird, man. Like, what is Vivian? I was on a phone call with Vivian once. There was just like a full grown sea turtle on the other side, just sitting there wetly in a gamer chair. It was really weird. All right, back to pandemonium. So I'm continuing to sketch freely and open-mindedly for pandemonium ideas. I'm just trying to get things out. I am not hell-bent on using any of these drawings. I just want to see what are my actual ideas. So I am drawing columns here, and I am reacting to the boringness of the plinth on that first sculpture that you can see behind my little sketchbook in the top left. Now the sheet, the pages that you're seeing here are in my little sketchbook, and I did this page uh, in the morning while drinking my coffee. Uh, no surprise to me that I am my most creative and strike upon the ideas that I like the most first thing in the morning over a big cup of caffeine. So I did these little sketches. I was looking at these beautiful double helix columns that I saw on churches in Florence. I got obsessed with them. I just thought they were some of the most beautiful, ostentatious, like variety filled over the top things I'd ever seen. And I did a little study there. You can see it in the on the right of the left hand side of the sketchbook right now. That's just a straightforward study of some photos that I took in Florence. And I started asking myself, well, what do I like about it? It definitely feels opulent and elaborate and over the top the way that I think I want the demons and their choices and their architectural decisions to feel. Um, and I started twisting it around. So I was looking for different silhouettes. You can see that I got sort of like a tornado or cyclone-like silhouette in the sketch in the bottom left of the right-hand sheet. And I liked that. That was starting to give me something. But I continued to elaborate and just ask myself, like, all right, well, why do I like that? Why do I like that it's pushed? Why do I like the intensity of the whirling? And the real thing that cracked this wide open for me was the sketch in the top right right now. You can see that I wrote knotted like a snake next to it. That was it. That unlocked it for me. That was the, the pushed beyond reality truth, right? Like those knotted double helix columns, I don't know what they're called. There's probably a real architectural name for those because uh, plenty of places have them. I had just never seen them before my trip to Italy. Those are already way cooler and way better than most things, including anything fantastical, right? Like anything you've seen in a video game or anything like that. Those real things that just some committed draftsmen, uh, not draftsmen, craftsmen made hundreds of years ago are by many thousands of times way cooler than most invented things, right? So when you're starting with something like that, um, there's no hope of making something cooler. It's already the most graceful, most beautiful, most refined, most aesthetic, most useful um, version of something, probably. That's what life tends to offer up. So instead of trying to make something better, it's, it's more like a struggle to just add something different some sort of a real variety to it, right? It's probably not ideal, right? But it is, you're just adding to the conversation and hopefully in a way that aligns with your design goals for the project. And that's what I got with that sketch in the top right. It is beyond, it's adding more opulence and exuberance, right? Now it, it spirals up and does the double helix thing, but then it explodes into this whirlwind of overlapping, nodding shapes. And then the thing that really made me fall in love with it for the project was it looks like a snake ball. It looks like a coiled python or something like that. And of course, that is perfect for uh, Satan, for the demons, right? For Satan as their leader. Um, and it really feels like it deals with the symbology of, of Satan for the Paradise Lost project, which of course, Paradise Lost definitely does not shy away from the connections between Satan and the serpent. And he does take the archetypal shape of the serpent later on in the story when he goes to um, uh, bother and harass Adam and Eve. So that sketch in the top right, you can see that I'm continuing to draw after, right? Because you don't ever want to just take it as a given that like, oh, that's it, just because you got that initial rush. But I do feel that way. Even while I'm doing this sketch in the bottom left, I'm just looking at that little sketch in the top right and I'm like, yeah, that's it, that's it right there. But you gotta keep going. You gotta keep turning things around and looking for other things. 
the idea directly to the right of where I'm drawing right now, where it says like a plant, which they don't have, that's of interest too. And uh, I, I dropped that there because it was a very different design idea than the one I was trying to solve in this little sketching session, which was specifically about um, columns. But I do need to go back to that. I, I, it seemed like a good idea to me that Pandemonium has basically everything. It's like over the top and rich and exuberant wealth, you know, just Baroque. But the but they don't have plants. They can't have plants, right? Because hell is blighted, right? They can't have the, the beauty of real nature that's reserved for the Garden of Eden later in the story. The Garden of Eden is where plants and animals and things like that live. So I thought if I'm transmogrifying the architectural elements and playing with the precious metals and the glasses, the igneous glasses from the volcanic interior of hell a lot, why not have them make their own plants basically as sculptures made out of stone and glass um, and precious metals? Think very like, um, like Chihuly, you know, the famous glass sculptor, um, who his work is, of course, very over the top and Baroque and opulent. Um, I think I want to bring a touch of that into pandemonium. So I'm going to have to go Google uh, some nice Chihuly pictures right after this and throw them into my reference folder. So that's what I'm drawing. And that's the results that I get to in this video. I want to take a step back though, to talk a little bit more meta about some of the things I take for granted here, because I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I want to do this because I was just talking with one of my students, uh, Dylan Coleman, and he's always good to remind me of how counterintuitive some of these things can feel to people who are starting out. So you're hearing me say all of these design thoughts, right? Like, oh, this links to this. This feels like that. This would be cool. Um, this would represent this idea. How do you how do you even get there? Or how do you evaluate those things? How do you put yourself on this course to make choices for yourself? So I'm going to try to give a the most practical answer that I can, which is difficult for this subject. And then uh, then I will give what I think is unfortunately the truth of the situation, which is highly impractical. So the practical answer. First, notice that I, I started this project by picking something I'm familiar with, right? I really think if you want to be a designer, if you want to get good at designing, if you want to practice designing, you need to practice it by picking an idea of scope. So in this case, a book, Paradise Lost by John Milton. You need to pick an idea of scope. It doesn't have to be a book. It could be a game. It could be a movie, something that you might change, take the name off of, whatever, right? And you need to design through it. You need to use the familiarity that you have with that product and its ideas and build designs around that familiarity. That is the only way you are going to have any criteria for yourself when you're starting out for whether something is going right or wrong. Now, I usually label that as the beginner project, right? And I've been doing this a long time. Look what I'm doing. I'm doing a beginner project, right? I'm doing, um, I'm not doing what I consider an intermediate or advanced project. Uh, just to break that down briefly, a beginner project is straight up illustrating a product that already exists. I am designing Paradise something from Paradise Lost, and it's not completely breaking it, right? I'm adding ideas, but I'm not saying Paradise Lost is like sci-fi now. That would be an intermediate project. An intermediate project is you take something that already exists, but you flip it. You either change its genre or you edit it in some big way. So uh, if you did Game of Thrones as your scaffold, but you made it a sci-fi story, right? So uh, all of the Game of Thrones houses are now galaxy-wide, uh, thousand-year-old imperiums that coast softly across solar winds on generation ships and things like that. That requires some amount of, let's face it, writing 
you need to write it, right? It doesn't matter how good you are at drawing, you need to have good writing ideas. And that's what makes it an intermediate project instead of a beginner project. And then there's what I consider an advanced project, which is just you write it, you draw it. It really is your own thing. You don't necessarily have hard hard analog, something to compare to. Um, you really should be extremely cautious of doing those projects without realistic expectations for how long they take. And if your realistic expectation sounds like anything less than a year, is probably unrealistic. Uh, it, it varies from project to project, but I'm just being honest with you about how long things take. So if you have a personal project like that and you think you can do it in less than a year, you're probably kidding yourself. So that's my basic breakdown. I'm doing a beginner project here, right? And I highly recommend that for most people who want to get good at designing, who want to practice designing. Otherwise, it's just... Bleh, it's just chaos. It could be anything, right? You could draw anything and never know if it's right or wrong or not right or wrong, but if it's appropriate or inappropriate or ingenious or sublime or clever. That's the language of design solutions that you need to be interacting with, right? And it's even more pernicious than that. The real problem is that if you don't have familiarity with the idea already, it will actually make your designs more boring, right? If you try to jump to an intermediate or advanced project without um, careful buildup, because there's no criteria for you, because there's nothing to push against, because there's nothing asking you, like, is this appropriate or not? Nine times out of 10, if you don't have a lot of experience, you will just make the same old crap. Why wouldn't you, right? Why wouldn't you just regurgitate the same plethora of cultural flotsam that is floating around in everybody else's head, right? Of course you will. Of course you will. You're not a genius. You know, there's very few geniuses out there. You're going to do the same thing as everyone else. And it's going to hurt you. It's going to be a waste of time. You, the better way to practice designing usually is to work within good boundaries, solid boundaries. And in, in fact, probably extreme boundaries, right? But at least a project that you're very familiar with, use that to press against and to ask you, like, you love this thing, right? This book, this movie that you're basing this on, you love it, you think it's great, right? What are you drawing this, adding anything to this thing that you already think is great, right? That, right off the bat, is something super useful for the designer. So start there, right? Start there, and now we go to the next question. How do you make the evaluations? Right? How do you go beyond just gut feelings and how do you evaluate if the sketches and the designs that you're doing are quote unquote good? All right. Um, again, we're going to get to the impractical answers here, but the most practical answer I could give is write it down. Really write it down for yourself as best as you can. Uh, I haven't done that yet for Pandemonium in particular, but that's for two reasons. One, I have written it down for Paradise Lost in general for myself uh, many times and rewritten it many times. I have many documents where I try to say to myself explicitly in language, do not think it, you must write it down, right? You, you don't think the way that you write. Thinking is emotional and is all fuzzy and airy and it's it's just clouds flitting by and you actually have you feel like your thoughts really have a lot in them and then if you write them down if you try to write them down you realize oh, oh there's nothing there and then that that will reveal to you that you need to get more concrete about what you're trying to do so i have written it down many times for paradise lost what i'm trying to do and changed my mind and rewritten it so i have in general for the whole project, what I think I want it to feel like and what thematic ideas I like and don't like about the project. But also on top of that, I have built up a lot of thinking about pandemonium. Um, and like I said, thinking is very, you gotta be careful with it, but it's built on much more solid, like really thoughtful um, past work about the same project. This is part of that project. So you should write it down you should try to say it to yourself. And you can write it in any form, right? Just do the part of writing that concretizes what the hell you're actually trying to say. 
And if you find that too open-ended, too confusing, I would say just make a chart, make a, a mind map, a word web. People have all sorts of words for it, but just write, you know, whatever your project is, let's just say write pandemonium on the middle of a piece of paper, circle it, and then just turn on a timer and free associate for 15 minutes. Just write down everything that you think connects with it. So if you were doing pandemonium, I'd say city scale, twisted, dark, St. Peter's Basilica, serpents, all demons, a home, a palace, basilica, just free associate. There's no right or wrong answers on that mind map and do it for a long time. You know, 20 minutes is not really a long time, but you, you might cut it off at 10 if you were doing it, uh, if you were doing it without a timer, do it for a while. And then remember no wrong answers and then go back with a critical eye to the word web and ask yourself, which, which of these words are really right? Which of these words really feel like pandemonium? Which stand out to me as these are the themes of this design, right? So edit out the stuff that really seemed um, too free association-y, too much like a Rorschach blot. Edit that stuff out and pick the maybe 10 words that really make you feel like that seems very right, right? And hopefully some of those are a little surprising, right? That's the point of free associating, that by letting your subconscious arise while you're making the mental map, you can find words that you perhaps wouldn't have gotten to straight up conceptually or rationally, right? So pick out the ones that really stand out, either for their obvious on the noseness or for their uniqueness, right? Like Baroque, obvious. Snakes, maybe less obvious, serpentine shapes, Art Nouveau, something like that. And compile those into a little list. And for now, you're always free to change it, but for now, that is your design direction for the project, right? Those are your little gates. Oh, speaking of Art Nouveau, um, you can see that I'm reacting to some of the sketches that I did for those columns in my little sketchbook. I saw that some of the lines were getting uh, very Art Nouveau-y, so I brought out my um, Alphonse Mucha Art Nouveau style book, and I'm looking at this, what is that, a candle holder or something like that, that I always remember from that book, and I'm just using it to kind of like inspire me and see how, see what a good curve looks like. He really had the best curves out there. So uh, back to what I was saying, that list of 10 items is now your design direction for the project. You're free to change it any time, but you want to ask yourself with every design that you do, does it hit not all of those points, but most of them? Does it hit more than it doesn't hit? Um, or is it going completely the opposite? Like if one of your design directions that you got from your free association was Art Nouveau, did you accidentally draw shapes that feel like Art Deco, which might, you know, art history speaking, it's very much the opposite, right? Well, I guess we could debate that, but um, it, it feels very different. One is more rectilinear, one is more curvy, right? So did you fall into doing something that is quote unquote off brand for the light bit of branding that you just did. Now, I know that doesn't answer the, is this a good design or bad design problem in any detailed sense, right? That goes into other questions like the utility of the design. You know, if you're designing for a video game versus a movie versus a book illustration, one design is gonna be quote unquote good and another is gonna be bad and then they're gonna flip flop depending on the product. So another good thing you could do is decide what product this is supposed to be. Is it a video game? Is it a movie? Is it uh, a VR experience? It's nice to, even if you're never going to turn it into that, give yourself those rails, have some sort of product in mind. Also a demographic, that's something they do in design school a lot. You pick the product that it's supposed to be and you pick what the demographic would be. So it's young men, it's young women, it's uh, middle-aged people, older people, uh, ephemeral gods, Lovecraftian monsters are supposed to love this product, whatever. You just pick some sort of demographic and you try to aim the styling and the presentation of the product towards them, right? So 
And those considerations, along with nitty gritty considerations of the principles of design, so rhythm, emphasis, variety, economy, repetition, balance, movement, continuity, scale, proportion, all of those things, nitty gritty, nitty gritty assessments of the principles are going to be what decides in a deeper sense, could this, let's say that those help you decide, could this design be better? Could it be clearer? Could it be more dynamic, right? But for if it's on brand with the product or belongs in the product, really the only way to determine that foundational question is to have decided for yourself what the thematic touchstones are for the project. And then you evaluate off of that. At that point, you're really being your own art director, which is essential for an illustrator when they are putting together stuff on their own, right? Once you're on the job, all this stuff gets handled, right? Somebody else has all of the big ideas and then they tell you what to draw. Unfortunately, there's this weird disconnect between the industry and trying to get into the industry where once you're on the job, like I said, that gets handled, but you have to be your own art director a lot of the time when you're just trying to figure this stuff out and make your own books. But that's just the way it is. You're just gonna have to accept that and you're gonna have to put on your art director hat for the beginning portion of your project. And then you need to hire yourself as the illustrator to do the drawings. That brings up a lot of other subtle issues like how if you're doing the art director portion, you really need to make sure that as the art director, you design a project that you would hire yourself for. It's pretty amazing how many projects never get done or started because in that first creative director frame, the person is choosing and getting excited for a project that they would never do. And they just are forgetting that. And then they like, after a week of like doing all of this planning, they sit down to draw and they're like, oh, I hate this. This is, you would definitely hire a different artist to do this. Why would I be doing this? You've got to make decisions that make you do the drawings, right? Um, in art, any choice, any choice that makes you not make the drawings was the wrong choice. It doesn't matter if your teacher approved. It doesn't matter if the whole industry approves. It doesn't matter if it's the most classic step in the process that everybody does and that this is the secret way or the not secret way to get to good art like thumbnails, color studies, whatever. If they make you not make drawings, they're the worst possible choice for you. And any other choice that would make you make drawings is the right choice. And it doesn't matter if nobody else does that. If nobody else has that as part of their process, who cares? Who cares? Things that don't make you make drawings, those are the only things that are a bad idea in art. And anything that does make you make drawings is a good idea. Now, the other part of the practical question that design students seem to encounter or bring up a lot is, okay, so I picked a project, right? I'm not just working in abstract. I picked a project and I'm and I have some thematic choices that I've made for it. I have some sort of touchstones for what I think I'm trying to get out of it. Now, how the heck do I have good ideas, right? How do I, I have a way to evaluate them, but let's say that I'm failing over and over again. Let's say that as much as I try all of my evaluations and whether they're hitting the theme or communicating the feelings that I want, I'm failing every time. How do I improve ideas? Now, some people would say this is impossible. I, I don't think it's impossible. I do think it's possible to improve your ideas. It's just unfortunately not really art related. To improve your ideas as a designer, for my money, you just need to write more, read more, live more, have weirder conversations, watch more stuff. Like you just need to, even the word research doesn't really do it, right? Because it's not just about researching the content of your current project, right? It's not just about, oh, well, I'm doing columns. What are, what do what have columns look like throughout history and what kinds of columns have they done? It's like, it's not, that's an important part. And that's definitely something that needs to be done. But in a broader sense, you just need to develop a fascination for how the world goes together 
You know, you need to develop a really keen interest in what makes a form look like a form, what makes a line look like a line, what makes something that feels aggressive look aggressive, what makes something that feels soft and friendly look soft and friendly. Like, you just need to become very, very interested in that. And you need to be fascinated with why stuff looks the way it looks. Like, look at... I mean, art history is one way to think about it, but it's really the history of everything, right? History, art history has always gone hand in hand with culture and technology and politics and anthropology. And it, it's really to look at art history in isolation doesn't make any sense, right? All of the artistic movements, all of the isms, all of the famous painters, the ones that really left the milestone markers for the way art has transformed, none of it was in isolation. They they became that. They affected art history because it was the right thing for the cultural moment, or it defined a cultural moment, and it leaked into philosophy and science and everything, right? Um, th there's no way around this. This has always been true. So you have to become very interested in that why. Why? Did hit, why did design look this way uh, in the 1950s to develop the mid-century modern look? Why did design look this way in the Baroque period? Um, what, what did the God? There's so it's everything. It, I'm, I'm, I was about to fish for like an example, like how the Baroque art of Italy was a response to the Reformation. It was counter-Reformation. It was trying to fight against the idea that everything in religion is supposed to be pared down. So they went the other way. They were like, no, 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 look at this, the opulence, look at the emotional impact of this overwhelming art and detail and opulence that would just drag people in by, by their teeth instead of the more Protestant side of things where things were going to be very downplayed and not decorated and not emotive, more uh, rational seeking instead of trying to speak to the emotions. I was going to fish for something like that. I guess I found it or I did say it, but that's not, it's weird to call that an example. That stuff like that is there for everything, for everything. Everything has something like that behind it for why it looks some way. So Th that that goes beyond our history. It really does go beyond our history. It's just history, right? It's just, wow, isn't it fascinating the way that everything is connected in this strange little world that we live in? You got to become very interested in that. Quick detour to talk about some of the drawing things I've been doing. Um, did I mention my material? This is my Pilot Lucina. Not right now. That's a Rot Ring HP 0.5 pencil, but the pen that I've been using most of this time is my Pilot Lucina fountain pen. It's the fine point and I, it has Pilot black ink in it. Look, I live in New York City. You just got to get used to it. All right. It's not going to get any better. It's always going to be that loud. <laughs> um, I just wanted to point out that I'm not doing it right now, but a like a few seconds ago, I was drawing upside down with the pen and that may look a little weird. It just to use the back of the nib instead of the normal part of the nib just gives you a slightly thinner line, very slight, um, almost imperceptibly slight. I, I only do that when I already have a line down and my brain goes, oh, if I, I would like a thinner line here. It's just like a totally comparative measurement. Like if I was using a, a medium that had much more thick to thin, this would be a much thinner line here. I'll just turn the pen around and use it and it'll give me a slightly thinner line. I think you'll see me do it here in a second. I think I throw down these bolder lines for this big overlapping coil on this column and then you'll, oh, there it goes. There it goes, there I'm doing it. That's it, yeah. See how it's just slightly thinner than the ones I put down with the other tip. It, you wouldn't see it if uh, you wouldn't see it if it wasn't if it didn't have that thicker line right next to it, right? But it's a it's a comparative reaction to just get that thinner line. Usually, I just draw with the pen normal. I just hold it in one position and and throw all my lines like that. And I'm using it again here for these finicky little lines for the interior pattern in between those framing elements. And I do that throughout as I fill this one out. This is 
basically an enlargement and a more careful drawing of the that first sketch that gave me the coiled snake idea in my little sketchbook. You saw me hold it up next to this bigger sketchbook for a second. I just kind of copied it one for one. It's basically the exact same drawing. I just redid it in pencil so that I could be a little bit more refined when I went over it with pen. Um, but it was just sort of concretizing that idea. So let's continue talking about the practicals. Well, let's see if we can wrap the practicals for this level starting out on a project. You should pick something that you're very familiar with so that you have some sort of objective criteria to base your ideas on. Then you should free associate to get some idea for themes for how you want to handle the look. And then you ask yourself for every design or sketch that you do, does it fit the theme? Is it actually hitting the things that I think this project should be? And the tighter you keep that, the more focused the project will be, and the more divergence and freedom you give yourself, the more scattershot the project will be. Neither is good or bad, it's just what you need in your life and your career right now. If you're trying to break in, you usually want to go for focus. Uh, you can do scattershot later. Uh, most directors are looking for focus. They don't really have a lot of time to parse wide shotgun things on their own. They just want to see, oh, that's exactly what we need. Right, give me that. So if you're trying to break in, focus is best. Then once you have a bunch of sketches and ideas that you feel fit the theme, then you evaluate them with the principles of design, right? And you either do that intuitively, right? Just which does happen if you've drawn a lot, right? If you've done a lot of life drawing, if you've analyzed a lot of references, if you have a lot of mileage with the pen in your hand, a lot of the principles just, they're in there. Even if you've never heard them, even if you've never broken them down, you draw with rhythm, you draw with variety, you draw with economy, you balance things nicely, you vary your proportions. You just do it intuitively because you've copied enough nice things and paid attention to enough nice things. But that usually does take longer than actually just hearing what they are, hearing what the principles of design are, and doing some base study of what each one means, which is its own can of worms. I'm working on it. I'm working on a, on a series about it. It's my white whale. We'll get there. So you use that to ask yourself for each idea that you already know is on brand, right? You already know this idea belongs in the project. You then use the principles of design to say, okay, how do I make it better? How do I make it more beautiful? Um, and then what comes after that? Then it's really like editing. That's really what it comes down to after that. I think if you're trying to put together a little portfolio book or something like that, you do all of that work, you run that process for all of these designs, and then you edit. You say, this one didn't make the cut. This one's bad, this one's good. You redo this, you scope out and add more things. It's editing, 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 editing. And that includes the idea of how you present it, right? How do you arrange the portfolio book when it's done? Do you lay it out nicely? Do you do some graphic design? Um, all of that stuff falls into the editing category, I think. And just like a movie, editing is the last step and editing really produces the film, right? Editing is really like, that final edit is the product that is seen. And it's not really the movie until it has reached its final clipped runtime and there's all the cuts that make up the two hours of interest, right? Same thing with a design book, right? People can flip through your sketchbook full of great designs as much as they want, but it's not really the product until you've presented it in a book or a video or a story, something like that. So you do wanna get there eventually. So that's the practicals, and that's a bit of context for what the heck you're doing when you're trying to put together a design book based on a project, which, as I said, is how you really practice design. A lot of people think that you practice design by looking at other people's finished designs and just trying to draw something that looks like that. No. Mind poison. A lie told by thoughtless people over and over again on the internet. Negative. Not real, not real at all. That is just a way to ensure that you are confused and lost and copying and not understanding what you're doing. 
That's not how you practice design. And that's not how you do stuff at work, right? If that's how you get work, once you actually arrive at work, you're gonna be like, oh God, I have, I have to do something completely different for what I thought my job was. So watch out for that. That is not how you do it. But that's what so many people online do. They think practicing to be a designer is all right. Now here's a bunch of images that I wish I could do. And I'm just gonna try to do something that looks like that. That will take 25 years for you to do that well. It's just not, that ain't it, that ain't it. You of course can do it, people have done it. It just takes way longer and you'll make way more mistakes and it'll make you crazy. You will be a crazy person at the end of it. Trust me, that's what happened to me. It's better to do the real way that you practice design, which is you design something, including the whole actual heavy lift of thoughtful decision-making at the beginning of designing something. So you're not just being spoon fed by your culture. Here's what stuff looks like. Here's what designs look like. Just try to copy that. That's going to hurt your head. That's going to hurt your mind. That's going to hurt your designer's mind. You do the thoughtful decision making at the beginning and then you move on from there and you design through the project. You go into the project and you base things on what the project needs, not does it look like the stuff on the front page of that website that I like. Ugh. Oh my God, okay, sorry. So you don't do that. You, you design through the project and you do a real project. That's how you practice design, right? Um, and it, it worked for me. That was the only thing that did it for me. It's not like it doesn't also take a long time. I do think it, it makes you better at this stuff faster than just blah, randomness. It does still take a long time um, to give you some idea like what I'm doing here, putting together a little design book with sketches and hopefully we get to finish and a variety of stuff like, oh, look at this statue, look at this column. I have been doing this stuff since I was like 17, I think. Uh, I applied to Art Center College of Design where I went to college. I applied there to get into the program at, was that 18 or 19? Well, I applied the first time when I was 17 or 18, I think. And then I applied with the portfolio that got me in when I was 19, I think. I'm a little fuzzy on that, but 18 or 19, I applied with four of these, four projects with designs for all of them. And each one was about like 30 pages, 30 to 50 pages. Like one was 30, another was 50, another was 30. 30 to 50 pages of design work like this. Iterations, different ideas, all these different shapes for all these different things, thinking through things conceptually. So yeah, I mean, the mileage is real, right? But I'm not, I'm, this is really how I learned how to do this stuff, by doing it. Right by by nineteen, I had done four of these. I had done like a hundred pages of of straight up design work, and then I did you know four more a year. No, four more a semester or something like that. Like let's say between two and four more a semester for the next four years. Right. So I've done tons of them. Right, um, and this will just be another you know another in the pile of little design folios all based on stuff, right? Books that our teachers told us to read or some very particular assignments or riffing on movies, things like that. Like there was always strong rails on all of those things. Like the four that I applied to school with were, one was a redesign of The Matrix. One was a redesign of Aladdin. One was a quote unquote original story, but it was it had heavy rails on it from doing it in uh, in a design class. So, like the instructor uh, Fabian Lacey, great artist, he gave us rails like your story has to have five characters. They have to have to break out of a place. They have to ride a vehicle at one point. Like there was very hard story points of stuff that had to be in it so that you knew what you there was going to be a minimum of stuff you had to design but you could fill it in with any details that you want. The vehicle could be whatever you wanted, uh, a camel, a, uh, a sewer crawling robot, or a spaceship or anything like that. You could, fluck, you could fudge the details a little bit, but you had to do something like that. And then the fourth was, damn, what was the fourth? God, this is so long ago, I actually don't remember. What was that fourth book? 
Man, I'll have to dig that up and find it. What was it? I remember that third one, the one with the rails. I did like an, an Arctic story. It was like a bunch of characters needing to traverse a frozen part of the Arctic, like the South Pole or something like that. But I forget what the fourth project was. So case in point is that I've probably forgotten more design books than you have made. So make one, please make one. You need to make one, right? You need to make one and you need to do enough that you've forgotten what some of them were, right? That's what's going to make you comfortable designing and getting through ideas, right? And a lot of that is not that you're quote unquote good at it, right? It, if you're pushing yourself and you're looking for strange new things, which I definitely am here, right? Like this stuff doesn't look as good as my best pencil drawings, right? But I don't care. You can't care about that stuff. And you got to be willing to put that stuff out there permanently on the internet forever because who cares if you mess it up? And who cares if you look like a dope? And who cares if it's not your best drawing? You got to be pushing yourself, man. You got to be doing new things and hunting for ideas. You got to be working at it and trying to stretch what you're capable of. So get on it. Don't wait around. Do it. And don't worry about it if you mess it up, right? The what you What actually makes you better as a designer as the years go on is that you are more comfortable with failure. That's all it is. You're more comfortable with not having the answer and you trust the process more. That's what makes you a better designer. In the beginning, what hamstrings you is the, is the pain of just how do I do this? And are bad ideas okay? And are failures okay? And that completely cripples a lot of artists. And at a certain point, you've just done it enough like I said, the point where you have forgotten more design books than a lot of people have actually done, you're just like, it's fine. It'll be fine. It doesn't matter. You just sit there and you research and you draw through it and you look for cool ideas and you react to things and you go on walks and let things come to you. And that brings me to the impractical. Now that I've discussed as far as I know, the practical way that you improve in designing. Oh, before I do that, let me just say that sketch on the left there, the colored version of the coiled column. That's what did it for me. That was the first design I've done on this sheet for this Paradise Lost project where I was like, that gave me the juice. I did that one. I threw my pencil down on the paper. I was like, I love this project. That is it. That's what I got to look for for everything. That is, mm, that's, mm, mm. that was, as soon as I did that, I was like, that's one of the that's one of my favorite things that I've designed, right? Now that's not a final drawing of it, right? It's done with markers, it's not super refined. There's definitely, you know, the base is all fucked up or whatever, but um, the design is the design idea, right? If I wanted this to be a gorgeous final design drawing, I need to blow it up, I need to do the details more carefully, I need to probably do it digital so that it's super clean and I can control the surfaces and the exact colors and someone else can take it. Before the idea, I was like, yeah, man, I like that a lot. That's really it, that's pumping me up. Uh, one of my favorite um, designs for a column, certainly, that I've ever done. And look at how many things I had to sketch to get there, right? All of the ones to the right of it, screw them. You know, they were important to look at. The one all the way on the right isn't bad. And I kind of like that it has the ball on the top, but it's all just data gathering to let me know that that one on the left is, mm, that's a design touchstone right there. Let's make other stuff look at that. I especially like that little, uh, I wish you could see me right now. I'm like pointing at it, at, at the particular thing I'm talking about in Premiere right now. I like that little negative space uh, near the top where the big coil sort of loops off the mass and there's no other negative spaces in the dense coil right underneath it, that really did it for me. Okay, so now that I've got that out of the way, um, back to just real quick, the impractical side of how you do this stuff. No one knows where ideas come from and that's very troubling and it's weird and I think if you're careful about it, it's freeing instead of scary. But I think, I'm pretty convinced if you just look at it, if you, meditation is the best way to see this for yourself. Not because there's anything magical about meditation, but it's just literally looking at your thoughts instead of thinking that you are, right? Just sitting down and watching them flow. Um, if you do that, you will find, I think anyone will have to honestly admit, when you have a good idea, you have no idea where it came from. You really don't. It just appears out of nowhere. 
And they certainly don't appear when you need them all the time. They certainly don't appear when you are at the drawing board where it would be appropriate and very useful for them to show up, right? No, where do ideas show up? They show up in the shower, on the toilet, while you're driving, while you're on a walk, when your friend says one weird word while they're talking to you at the bar and all of a sudden you're like, wait, that, that right, that's perfect for that thing that I'm drawing. That's how ideas come. And the way you experience an idea being concretized subjectively is that it bubbles up from a subjective mystery behind your eyes and you suddenly notice it's there and you're like, oh, that works. And then it goes away. And anything besides that is a story you're telling yourself, unfortunately. Your you certainly don't have any experience of authoring them, right? You de there's no one has ever had an experience of like, okay, now I'll have a good idea and then dropped their consciousness down to the level of the plethora of subtle experiences that produce an idea. No one has ever done that. No one has ever experienced that. It just shows up. It just pops into memory, into experience out of nowhere, right? Th that that basically breaks all of our narratives about ideas, right? If if the truth, and again, I think upon inspection, it really is the truth that they simply arise from who knows what your subconscious is doing, right? Crunching the numbers on a billion different experiences, some flower that you saw yesterday, your girlfriend in high school, your dog when you were a kid. It's crunching the numbers on all of those and sublimating them into wouldn't this be a cool column or something like that? Like, what the hell? It really is amazing what ideas get involved in the generation of other ideas and you don't control it. You know, only the deeper you control it, maybe, right? That's the problem. Even the idea that it's your subconscious offering them up is honestly a guess. You know, it really just aligns with our current culture and, you know, our viewpoint, my personal prejudice on how things work. Because unfortunately, the truth of how ideas present themselves is, as far as I can tell, completely, it aligns completely with the idea that some art demon lives in some other place or inside of you and it is doing all of this and it does all the thinking and it does all the planning and it has all the good ideas and then it just feeds them to you. Unfortunately, I have never experienced anything in art making or design subjectively that would make that impossible. I don't think it's true, right? I, I, I personally don't actually believe that, but if I met someone who told me straight up, yes, I have a demon, an actual entity, a god of some sort that lives on another plane and it feeds me all of my art ideas and it does the drawing. If I look closely enough, there is nothing in my subjective experience of having ideas or making art that could disprove that. I don't know where ideas come from. No one does, they just show up. And you don't know how you draw either, unfortunately. There's so many things involved with it that do not amount to I mean, have you ever even had a conscious thought about how you're moving your hand? Like only at the very beginning. And, and as soon as you're doing it, you're usually messing up and it only goes well when you're not thinking about it, right? So good God, you know, there's really nothing in the, in the mechanical act of drawing or in the conceptual experiential doing of art that would, yeah, not align with the idea that ideas come from elsewhere completely and you are not the author and they're not subjectively yours. So make of that what you will, whatever is true, it seems to certainly be true experientially that you get to feel like you're doing it. But I think that that's as far as we can go. That really is as far as we can go. Uh, I personally find that freeing. I love knowing that no one knows what this is and that I don't know what this is. That way, whenever I get super neurotic and scared or really start comparing myself to others or start believing what other people say about art, like, oh, art is this and you need to do it this way and this is what design is and this is what a good designer or a good artist looks like, I can always remind myself that person has no idea. No one has any idea. It could be anything. It's the full deductive miracle. It's 
life is a mystery. Drawing is a part of life. So drawing is a mystery. There's something really deep and useful about that. I just try to remember it as often as possible. It's very useful. I have found it very useful when things get hard and confusing and I get a little bit lost. You should think about it sometime. All right. Thank you for drawing today. There's the sheet uh, with some first batch of designs for pandemonium. And uh, we got some statues, got some candelabra, painting, and we got some cool columns. Columns are good touchstone. Bye.